right, so last unit we talked about bonding and different bond types, single, double, triple bond, odd bonds, all these bonds. So that's last unit. And we talked about how to know if it's a, how to draw the bonding structures and all that. And we talked about vesper shapes. Those are all intramolecular things, okay? So this unit is intermolecular forces. So now we're going to extend our understanding of bonding into how the types of bonds affect how molecules or compounds uh, interact with the things around them. So these are between two separate molecules. In tromolecular forces, if you have a Lewis structure and you have drawn a line, that is an intramolecular force. That is a bond holding the two atoms together with shared or transferred electrons. Okay? We already learned about intramolecular forces. What we're talking about today, these dotted lines, those are really just showing some kind of coulombic attraction from one molecule to another molecule, or one particle to another particle. So this is an intermolecular force. Okay? This is not a real bond in, in, in the sense that electrons have been transferred or are being shared. This is a positive dipole and a negative dipole there is an electrostatic attraction here, but that is not the same as a hydrogen and oxygen sharing electrons. When you're answering FRQs and things in this unit, you have to be very diligent to not say intramolecular instead of intermolecular. Okay. So far, so good. Cool. So it begins. All right, so the first kind. We're going to talk about several kinds, and I'm going to take it one at a time, give you a little break, let it soak in. The first kind of intermolecular force is an ion dipole force. Now, this picture is a little bit intimidating. If I show you the next picture, it's a little bit better. So, look. Do you remember this, guys? Sodium and the negative dipoles of water, and then chloride and the positive dipoles of water and how they interact. Okay. It's not so cut and dry to say that this is the strongest intermolecular force. But if I was going to generalize, this is the strongest intermolecular force. So what I have here, I have the negative dipole of a polar molecule. And typically this is going to be water. Surrounding a cation and the positive dipole of a water molecule surrounding an anion. So this is just like my sodium chloride, right? So that's not a big deal. That's, that's like the definition. How you feeling? It's okay? Okay. And these are two separate particles, right? So this is intermolecular because this is a different particle than the sodium. Okay. So back to this. Back to Coulomb's law. It never goes away. Super excited about it. All right. So I want to talk about I want to talk about um, solubility. Remember our solubility rules? That was cool. That was a thing. That's not problems. Okay. So let me give you. We had talked about strong acids just real quick. Strong acids and strong bases and how they dissociate, right? And so they break up. So let me tell you something. Barium hydroxide is a strong base. Myself a little. That makes me feel better. So, this is a strong base. But magnesium hydroxide is a weak base. Okay? Now, that's one set of situations. Now, let's take this a little bit further. Are y'all right? So, again, I like it. A lot depends on this. What about if I have something like sodium carbonate? Sodium carbonate is soluble. Yeah. Calcium carbonate is what seashells are made out of. Well, they better not be soluble. Poor seashells. Unless the water's acidic, and that's another class. Um, mm -hmm. There we go. So this is soluble. This is not soluble. So these are two separate situations. Now when I say a strong base, y'all understand that that means that that is going to break up in the water. Okay? 
okay? And the wheat base will stay together. Okay. So, <clears throat> talk with the group. Think about it. Think about Coulomb contraction, okay? You have to remember that what's happening here, y'all, let me kind of draw this out for you. Um, barium is a, a larger um, ion, and then magnesium is going to have to be smaller. Let me push a button. Okay, let me get you some hydroxides on there. Um, and this, of course, is a large lattice, and it continues. But um, there's my hydroxides. There's my hydroxides. Barium uh, hydroxide dissociates in water. Magnesium hydroxide does not. Um, this breaks up in water. This does not. So um, think about the ion dipole interactions versus the lattice energy. Y'all remember lattice energy, right? So it's holding these ion bonds together. The energy that's released when the bonds are formed, which is the same energy that's needed to pull them apart. So I want you in your group to come up with a couple sentences using the word Coulomb contraction, lattice energy, ion dipole interaction. And explain to me why this is happening and why this is happening. Okay? If you look back at Coulomb's formula, if you need to, magnitude of charge is divided by the distance. Okay? Ready to go. Okay, that was the saddest bell ring ever. There we go. Um, so it's okay if you're having trouble putting this together, but it's good to kind of start thinking about what we need to say. Um, so Abby, can you use the words lattice energy, coulombic attraction, and ion dipole force or interaction uh, to describe to me why barium hydroxide is a strong base of magnesium hydroxide? Can you tell me about the Coulomb attraction between magnesium and hydroxide versus barium and hydroxide? Which one has a stronger Coulomb attraction? Yes, magnesium hydroxide 
between the magnesium and the hydroxide, there is a stronger Coulomb contraction because the ionic radii of magnesium is smaller than the ionic radii of barium. Y'all still with me? Cool. So, when they have a greater Coulomb contraction, the lattice energy of magnesium hydroxide is greater. That is the energy released when the magnesium hydroxide come together. That energy that's released when they come together is the same amount of energy that has to be put into it to dissociate it, to break it apart, to ionize it. Okay, so if the lattice energy of magnesium hydroxide is greater than barium hydroxide, Jonathan, can you kind of fill in why magnesium wouldn't dissolve? Magnesium hydroxide wouldn't. So here's the deal. The lattice energy in magnesium hydroxide is greater than the ion dipole interactions between water and the magnesium ion hydroxide. When you put salt in water, magic fairies don't break it up. What happens is the ion chloride or the sodium, the ions are more attracted to the water than they are to each other. That force is greater than the ionic bonds. If the ion dipole force is greater than the ionic bonds, then it will break up. If it's not, then it won't. Not every ion compound you put in water dissolves. Case in point, right hand side of the board. Would y'all like to re revise your answers? I'm gonna pick somebody else to pick, talk about the right side. The water can't overcome the lattice energy yeah. of the calcium carbonate. And why do you think what's the difference between calcium carbonate and sodium carbonate? Because they're different chemical compounds. Yeah. Because they're different chemical compounds. Um, while, while true, calcium is actually bigger than sodium. So that would, if we we're only looking at size, that would actually make calcium more soluble, calcium carbonate, if that was the deal. So, when we talk about Coulomb's law, do y'all remember what Trump's size? Charge. charge. Magnitude of charge. Sodium is one plus, calcium is two plus. So, because the larger magnitude of charge on the calcium ion, the lattice energy of calcium carbonate is larger than the ion dipole interaction between calcium carbonate and water. Um, so, it will not dissociate in the water. It will remain as an ion bond. That was so sad. That's neat, isn't it? That's cool. It's kind of cool, right? Yeah. Now, listen. Here's the deal. Let's think about our solubility rules. You remember our solubility rules? Think about all the things that are soluble. Group one, 
So group one metals are sodium, lithium, M is not an element, I'm just saying sodium, lithium, potassium, they're all one plus. Group 17 metals, mm -mm. group 17 halogens, so my fluoride, my chloride, my iodide, all those, they're soluble. Then we also have um, nitrate, that was always soluble, right? No, remember that? And then we had ammonium, always soluble. So, what do you notice about everything that's always soluble? Okay, you can turn this one. That's why, that's why we're soluble. That's why. All in the silence, right? You didn't really, y'all don't really want to know that today, did you? That's why things disappear in water. Goes back to PowerPoint. A little bit. Okie dokes. So here we go. If the cation anion attractions are stronger than the ion dipole attraction, the compound will not be soluble. That's what we had just talked about. And I used the word lattice energy, which is a better way to say it. If the lattice energy is bigger than the ion dipole interaction, it's not going to dissociate. And, and to be honest with you, it will dissociate, but at a very small degree. We'll talk about that later, and there's math involved. See you in November. Yay. Sad times. So, oops, I think I went the wrong way. There we go. So, anyway, magnesium hydroxide is not soluble, but barium hydroxide is because the force of attraction between the magnesium hydroxide, the lattice energy, is larger uh, than barium hydroxides. And this one happens to be uh, the lattice energy is smaller than the ion dipole of attraction between it and water. This is the first kind. They're still on the first kind of an intermolecular force. We're on the first kind. You good? Doubt slap moves on. Um, let's just say we're not talking about, now this is, this is where things get a little screwy. If we weren't talking about barium hydroxide and magnesium hydroxide, if we were just talking about barium and magnesium, or if it makes you feel better, let me do this and make you feel better. Um, you know those halogens, the fluoride, the chloride? So if I have fluoride right here, and then I have uh, chloride over here, I, I should have got a different color. <clears throat> I don't know, chloride is just go with green, whatever. What? Right? Okay. So if we just think about Coulombic attraction, and look, just look at this part and this part. Water has a greater Coulombic attraction for fluoride or with fluoride or chloride. Everybody. Fluoride because it's smaller. So the distance is smaller. And um, so the Coulombic attraction, the ion uh, dipole attraction of this is greater than the ion dipole attraction of that. And same is true with barium and magnesium. Still not strong enough to overcome the lattice energy though. Different situation. See why I canceled my two days off? Off. Because it's two days off. Yeah, okay. Alrighty. Moving on, sweet children. Um, this is what I've just been saying, but it's in another picture. So again, we have the ion bonds. If the ion dipole uh, attraction here between the positive dipole and the anion is stronger than the ion bond and vice versa, um, then it will dissociate. It can dissolve. That's the first kind. Done. Let's just take a little break. Just let that soak in, okay? Just take like one minute. 20 minutes. All right, so dipole-dipole interactions. In the pogol at the end of the pogol, we're talking about hydrogen chloride versus hydrogen bromide, okay? So this is just your uh, polar molecules like H, CO, right? and these are where I have a permanent dipole. Like the molecule is polar because it's polar. Like there, you know, you have uh, either unshared lone pair or excuse me, um, unsymmetrical lone pair or have a polar bond that's not symmetrical or something like that. Okay. Um, in this case, then there, um, if I put these 
uh, molecules together, then the um, negative dipoles will be attracted to the positive dipoles of their neighboring molecules. This is not, this is just like little magnets, okay? And so when I put them together, they're going to, don't let this freak you out. Look, they're disarranging themselves by maximizing the attraction between the positive and the negatives. No big deal, okay? And if it's a liquid, they're going to float around. And this is what water does. When water, this is, you know, Moses can part the sea, but like you got to break some ion Oh, excuse me, some dipole-dipole attraction. So this is why it hurts when you do a belly flop because the positive dipole of water is stuck to the negative dipole of the next water. And so that's why it hurts. It feels like a solid surface because of those dipole interactions. Huh? Yeah, I'm just, I'm pausing to let that soak in. Yes, but it's stronger in water because of the hydrogen. But yeah, this is what surface tension is. If you've ever put drops of water on a penny or something, like this is what's allowing it to happen. Yes? So with those um, non-Newtonian fluids and stuff, what's happening with cornstarch, um, they're fluid, and then when you put like a fast force on it, it kind of creates this little matrix and that's not this directly related to this and I can't right now put it into good words for you but um that's not that's not this um anyway so there's my dipole dipoles so this is the second kind right now the second kind has a special category within it which is hydrogen bonds. Don't look at this. This is scary. Don't freak out. Okay? Um, do you remember what I told you about hydrogen bonds? They just want to have fun. So if I have a fluorine or a nitrogen or an oxygen, so I'm just going to go with oxygen, okay? In a intramolecular bond with hydrogen, True actual bond, intramolecular bond. And then I have another fluorine, oxygen, or nitrogen. And just for fun, I'm going to go with fluorine. Okay. And the fluorine can be bonded to anything. Just carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, it doesn't matter. Okay. There will be, and it has a lone pair, which... We do like carbon tetrafluoride or whatever. Right. This fluorine has three lone pairs. Right? Are you okay? Do you understand the fluorine has lone pairs? There will be this positive dipole here. There will be an attractive force between this hydrogen and this uh, very electronegative that's a hydrogen bond. It's not a real bond as far as electrons getting transferred, but it's a very strong dipole dipole bond. So when you're when you're looking for hydrogen bonds, you're looking for a sandwich. You know, you make a bologna sandwich, it needs to have bologna in the middle. You make a hydrogen bond, it has to have hydrogen in the middle. So let me show you what that looks like. Like you need to have, the bread can be nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine, so. Then oxygen with some lone pairs. The bread can be different kinds, right? You have different kinds of bread. But the, ox, mm -mm, the hydrogen has to be in the middle. A hydrogen needs to be in a, a line, in a Lewis structure, connected to something else. And then some dotted intermolecular coulombic attraction kind of things going on. How do you how does that make sense? Okay. So you need a hydrogen sandwich and then one of the pieces of bread is oxygen nitrogen or, or fluorine and the other one is two. One is it's a line and a bond and the other one is an attractive force. That could be pictured or could not be pictured. Two sandwich. So now let's look at this and practice it, okay? Um, by the time I'm done with you, you will understand.
understand this really well. So this is a fluorine nitrogen or oxygen uh, and a bond with a hydrogen. And then there's my intermolecular force there. And then there's a lone pair and another nitrogen oxygen pair. These are about 10 times stronger than a normal or typical um, dipole-dipole interaction, but it is a special kind of dipole-dipole interaction. Like water is polar, right? But because it has the situation where I have the sandwich idea, it has hydrogen bonding. And hydrogen bonding is why it takes so long to make spaghetti. Okay. okay, so they're very, this is why it goes down. These bonds are very polar. And then fluorine, oxygen, and nitrogen are actually the three most electronegative elements. So you have these pretty strong dipoles. No, I don't think so. I think nitrogen, oxygen, or, I mean, I would bet money on it. Not chlorine is close, but you can Google it if you want to. Um, so let's look. I'm looking for hydrogen bonds. I need a hydrogen in the middle of the sandwich. I need a, a line connected to a fluorine or oxygen or nitrogen. And then I need an interaction here that may or may not be pictured. And then an oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine with a lone pair. And I do have it. And that's the, that's the um, hydrogen bonds in water. Well, because it's bigger, that's why it's not doing it. Then how much is it bigger, like 0.1? Okay. It doesn't hydrogen bond because it's a larger ion. All right, so let's look. Here's water and methanol, water and ethanol. All alcohols can have hydrogen bonds. Remember the hydroxyl groups I was proved a minute ago? Let's look at it. So here's water. I have an oxygen, nitrogen or chlorine, but I have an oxygen with a lone pair. And then inside of this methanol, here's my hydroxyl group. I have hydrogen and a bond with oxygen. So this is my intermolecular force. That's my hydrogen bond right there. See it? Methanol can also hydrogen bond with itself. Let me see if I can draw. They don't have that on here, do they? I'm going to make a really long line, like longer than what actually happened. Let's see. I'm going to make this better. Let me just make this go away. Okay. You ready? Hydrogen bond. Um. Oh, they're both on the wrong side. It's probably faster for me to draw a whole other molecule. All right, here. If I put Can you see that that's the molecule of alcohol? The alcohol can hydrogen bond with itself. They don't have that Look for all the sandwiches. You see a bunch of sandwiches? One side of the sandwich got a line, the other one's with that. Good times. Y'all are so quiet. You're just like, oh, shook sure. nervous. All right, so um, this is, they'll show um, the nucleic acids in DNA and more complex molecules, like this one. Okay? Don't let this freak you out. It could be a huge molecule. You're just looking for sandwiches. So look, I see. So look for the hydrogen first, and make sure it's in a bond with nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine. And so here I see that, right? And it is in a hydrogen bond with this oxygen. And then same here. DNA is held together this way. Did y'all talk about that in AP biology? I know you do. But this is what holds together the, uh, and we'll look at that. This is what holds together those acid-base pairs. This little, I'll show you. Don't worry. All right, now <clears throat> ethanol or ethanol doesn't hydrogen bond. So ethanol would have a line here and a hydrogen, but here I have a double bond instead. So do you see how the first thing to look for is look for hydrogen bonded to nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine? Do you see a hydrogen bonded to a nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine? No, so it doesn't hydrogen bond. So that you can answer that question real quick. 
But they, what they might do on the AP exam is they'll give you two molecules, and they'll, uh, you know, you'll have to figure out by looking at just one of them. They won't have the other one drawn. Could a hydrogen bond? And this one could not because you don't even have a hydrogen bonded to an NO or S. Okay, so that's it. Cool. All right, let's take this one color at a time. Green. These are group 16 um, elements. Oxygen, sulfur, selenium, and uh, tellurium. You see them? Now, water has a very high melt, uh, excuse me, boiling point because of the hydrogen bonds. H2S, could it, can, H, can hydrogen sulfide, can it hydrogen bond? It doesn't have a hydrogen with an N, O, or F, does it? So you see a dip here in boiling point because it doesn't have hydrogen bond. Now it is, it does have dipole-dipole interactions. Hydrogen sulfide is polar. Okay. Now look at the boiling point going up again. You want to guess why that happens? What do these have more of? As I go down uh, a group, they have more what particles? Yeah, these are more polarizable. Isn't that fun? They're more polarizable, so they have those greater London dispersion forces. So the boiling point goes up. We haven't got to that yet. That's after I get done to explain this and prime. Okay? So same thing with ammonia. Ammonia hydrogen bonds. Let me show you that. Y'all right, know what ammonia looks like. And given one ammonia, you can in your mind see that I have a hydrogen connected to an NO or F, don't I? And then if I have another ammonia here, hydrogen bond. They may not give you that second one, you have to see it. Alright, anyway, ammonia hydrogen bonds, but then we see that this won't hydrogen bond, and the boiling point is going up again because the, um, the elements become more um, polarized. They have more electrons. And then methane cannot hydrogen bond because it doesn't have a hydrogen connection to an N or F. And so the bullet point as I go down group four just goes up because of the increasing London dispersion forces. Okay, and so this is, we talked about this, this is the theme. So these particles are going to arrange themselves such that they're going to reduce potential energy. So dipoles are going to come together and attract uh, or be close to each other if they're attracted because that, that's just like this pen, you know, it's going to sit on the desk because that's lower potential energy. That's all this is showing, right? They're going to maximize the attraction force. This is just... And of course, if you have a stronger dipole, then it's going to have a stronger dipole-dipole interaction. That's all that's saying. Okay, so that's the second kind. Moment of silence, take a little break. I'll hit the pause button. This one doesn't come up as much as the hydrogen bonding with the dipole dipole and the ion dipole and the LDFs. This one doesn't come up as much. But if I did have something, like for example, if I took chlorine gas, right? Chlorine, chlorine is nonpolar. Cl2 is nonpolar. Still good? If I were to dissolve chlorine gas into water, then the polar water would induce a dipole in the nonpolar chlorine. So let me, it might be better if I kind of draw in my, my chlorine here. Okay, so what's going to end up happening is the electrons, uh, the positive dipole will cause the electron cloud to, you know, be evenly distributed to more distributed toward the positive dipole because so that this is kind of a temporary thing, it just happens, um, but this isn't, they don't really test on this very much. That's it, that's all. Um, moving on. So the re attraction resulting from this are stronger, obviously, if you have a stronger dipole. So if you have a really polar molecule, it would be able to pull the electrons to that side, to the positive side more. And it's also going to depend on how polarizable, mm, 
how polarizable this molecule is. So if I had bromine, right, it would be more polarizable. So this uh, interaction would be stronger than um, water and chlorine gas. You follow me? This is so much fun. I'm having the best time ever. All right, now here's the... Here's the last kind. This is the most important kind. Take the AP exam. If you don't know, this is the answer. Okay? Um, everything has London dispersion forces. Everything does. Because everything, except for hydrogen ions, have electrons. Okay? So, anyway, these forces exist between all, all things. Everything has London dispersion forces. And so, this is the idea that the electrons in an atom are like a flock of sheep, and they just kind of can mathematical probability over time will show that they will come to one side or another side and just random motion, okay? So, and this is really more that the, the valence <coughs> electrons are doing this too. The core electrons are, you know, held in a little bit tighter. Anyway, so this is showing what's happening here. If we have, um, if we have a noble gas like krypton or something, right, its electron cloud could be at any point in time more shifted to the left. And that would create a temporary negative dipole there. The electrons that are polarized, that are moved to the side, are typically more the valence electrons. The core electrons are held more tightly in because of the Coulomb attraction. It's both. It's both. But um, the outer electrons could be valence, but also maybe the energy level below it. They're the ones that are going to be able to be polarized because they're not as tightly held to the nucleus because the Coulomb attraction is less because the distance is greater. Yes, it is a lot. Um, but anyway, at any time during Krypton's existence, sounds like the beginning of a Superman movie, um, the electron cloud can just be, you know, a little bit more concentrated to any side. And you have this temporary dipole wherever the electron cloud is more concentrated as it shifts back and forth. So overall, Krypton is a nonpolar atom, but at, a, at an instant, it could be that it has a temporary dipole. Just as this is like the styrofoam on the table. Are you feeling me here? Do I need to come over there and throw some styrofoam to one side? All right. So if I look here, and you can see that if these are all Krypton atoms, and the electron cloud in this one, <coughs> just happens to be a little bit farther to the right, that will induce a negative, um, or it will, that will make it have a temporary negative dipole, which will induce a positive dipole here and a negative dipole and a positive dipole. And so this is um, induced dipole, induced dipole. It induces it in the next one. Like if you induce labor, you start labor. And then a dipole here will create or start a dipole. And so, um, you can see that over time, the ones around it are, will be affected by this. And so, the more polarizable the atom, the larger this force is. And so, let's think about those noble gases, okay? Which of the noble gases would have a higher volume? Talk to your neighbors.
have them. It did just say that it has the most electrons. It didn't say that. Um, this is why in H where you had to say like biodiversity loss caused by habitat loss, right? We had to see both of them. It's like that. So radon, right? If we go ahead in here and we, um, if we were to like, let's just pretend this top one is helium, okay? And helium has uh, two electrons. If they both, if they both kind of get to this side, then it will repel the ones in the next one. And so you have this temporary attraction here and here and here. It's temporary. Now, if I have radon, it has 86 electrons. So if they all happen to be over here, or they're more uh, concentrated over here, I mean, of course, you would have this, yeah, okay. But that do that induced dipole, induced dipole attraction would be way stronger. So you have 86 electrons versus two, okay. Um, so because it is more polarizable, so it has more electrons. Um, that that one, this is a this is this is a London dispersion. London dispersion forces would be greater, causing it to have to have uh, a higher temperature to boil. Now, boiling point for radon is obviously uh, lower than room temperature because it's a gas at room temperature, but it is it is lower. It's even higher, highest of the noble gases. So that do you kind of understand now, like better why fluorine and chlorine are gases? Bromine is a liquid and iodine is a solid. Can you kind of see it? Because those are on the polar. And so it all is just going to go back to, you know, how many electrons it has. All right, so speaking of that, here's helium, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. <laughs> and here's their boiling point. And notice here, this is very interesting, 460 degrees Kelvin is actually, that makes the boiling point of iodine greater than the boiling point of water even though hydrogen bonds are stronger overall generally than London dispersion forces, if you have enough electrons, London dispersion forces can actually be stronger than hydrogen bonds. You know plastics are made of oil? Remember how I told you that? That's all nonpolar. Do you know the only thing that holds plastic together is London dispersion forces? That's why they melt so easy. Yeah, and the thing is, what they do is they make them long chains, like a long chain of hydrocarbon and a long chain of hydrocarbon, and then you have a really big surface area where the London dispersion forces can create these temporary dipoles, and they stick together. And then when you cook your food in your microwave too many times, they start to break down. Isn't that fun? Plastic. The ions in your tears have a lower have a lower lattice energy than the energy of the ion dipole attraction, don't they? I think my book actually jumped. Right <laughs> Thank you. All right, um, larger species with more electrons are more polarizable. They have a weaker hold on their outer electrons because they have more energy levels, so the distance is greater. When moving down a group or constructing molecules with more atoms, the resulting species has electrons and is larger. The more electrons the species has, the more polarizable it is. You got it? Okay. So... Do you remember at the beginning of class where I had to, do, to draw those molecules? Yeah. The one, the two propanol was a circle, and the propanol was more of a, a linear shape. Are you okay? Yes. Are you crying from laughing? <laughs> oh, gosh. Sorry. <laughs> I haven't made anybody cry in a while. Goals. Anyway, I got some Play-Doh out. Let me show you. Play -Doh. I got some Play-Doh right here. Now, what has more surface area? 
press here, or if I squish this down, the pancake. The pancake, right? That's good, like fourth grade music time. You know this. So even though these are isomers, they have the same formula. The one on the right is more polarizable because it has a greater surface area to form these temporary dipoles and be stuck for a second to the next one. You see what I'm saying? So, yeah. We would expect, on the AP exam, what they'll do is they'll throw up a picture like this. And it's like, if I didn't explain this to you, you'd freak out, right? You'll be like, which of these species has the highest pulling point? Well, this one, the one on the right it has more surface area to uh, have those London dispersion forces. Okay? So the propanol, the 2-propanol has a higher boiling point than propanol. Okay? Now, going back, I'm going to do this before we end today. I want to give, I'm going to give you guys a drop of methanol and a drop of ethanol. Which one do you think will evaporate faster? Talk to your group. Under do now. Here's your methanol on the left and your ethanol on the right. Methanol, here's your methanol on the left. Here's your ethanol on the right. Here's your methanol on the left and your ethanol on the right. Now, did y'all notice how I had to take the ethanol and spread it out? It didn't drop and spread out like the methanol did. It's a larger molecule, so it has is more polarizable, so it actually sticks to itself better. Did you just see that? Do you want me to show you again? The ethanol. Oops, I did that wrong. Ethanol. Okay. Ethanol. <laughs> Are they evaporating? If you blow on them, they will evaporate faster. I told you, Chase. You were kidding. Oh, no, I was. Why did they evaporate so fast? I didn't ruin our data. What data? Qualitative data? Yes. I was kidding, though. And what time? alcohols on your table. Is your methanol evaporating faster? That is because it is has less electrons so it is less polarizable than ethanol. Also, um, when you look at your ethanol, it kind of didn't pull out as much because it had like it, it stayed in this and I had to spread it out with my little dropper. 
Um, so if you were asked, what they will do is they'll, you know, they'll put these two molecules on the AP exam, and I saw my test, I know this, because I already saw it. And they'll say, which of these would have a higher bone point? And so you'd have to know it would be the one with right? And then, listen here. Wait, hang on, hang on. Wait, I'm going to go back to that. Now they, hang on. Now they would ask you which one has a higher bone point. Is it the same answer? Guess what this one would have? This would have the capability of what? Hydrogen bonding in this way. So now this is the answer. That's not even cool. We're not done yet. It's okay. I mean, we're done for today. That's enough. Also, like the one away, does it have the type of electron? It's good to the when you have when you have the capability of hydrogen bonding that unless the molecules come like really really larger that's going to win and they won't do that to you I'm going to start trying on outfits and asking you what you think about them you're that person alright so um, I'm just going to like I said go back through this in case you weren't here or um, something like that. So intra, listen, to tell if it's an intramolecular force or not, okay, if it's not a line in a Lewis structure, it's not an intramolecular force. Draw the Lewis structure. If it's a line, then it's part of the molecule. That's pretty solid reasoning, I think. Intramolecular, depending on, uh, excuse me, intermolecular, depending on how lucky you are, it may have one of these fake little intermolecular dash lines, but it might not have that, and so you have to be able to put that in there yourself if you need to. Um, ion dipole, this is where I'm dissolving something in water, usually. could be other things, but this is typically how it goes down. And recall that, um, you know, the negative dipoles of the water surround the positive dipole. We've been through this before. And so the deal is, um, if the, here we go, if, okay, if the, um, Ionic bond here, if I look at the lattice energy of an ion, oh, of an ion compound, if um, I'm comparing that force there, that's, that was the energy that was released when that bond was made, if that is greater in magnitude than this attraction, then it won't be soluble. And so if this bond is stronger than this attraction, then it won't be soluble. And if this bond is weaker than that attraction, then the ion will dissociate. And you know, all ions dissociate to some point, and they have numbers for that. And we'll see in, and I was, it sounded like a long time when I said, like, I'll talk to you about that in November, but that's next month. Um, sad, sad cries. Um, anyway, yeah, so that's the thing. So this ion dipole force could actually be stronger than ionic bond. Depends, right? And so that's where our solubility rules come in. We talk about Coulomb's all. And so the magnitude of the charge is typically things that are always soluble, ammonia, nitrate, group 1 metals, group 17 halogens. Um, they're soluble because the magnitude of the charge is low, 1 plus 1 minus, okay? Things with a 2 plus charge, 3 plus charge, like aluminum, for example, aluminum, almost everything except a halogen is soluble, excuse me, insoluble. These words are just a couple letters apart, you know. One times. Dipole, dipole, this is where you have two polar molecules, and so um, they're going to um, try to maximize attraction, opposites attract. So that's my um, dipole, dipole interaction right there, my Coulombic attraction between the molecules. I don't, I hope Coulomb is happy to know that I've said his name more times than I care about. Um, anyway, so they're going to arrange themselves to maximize attraction and minimize repulsion, and you can just see that here. Um, and then liquids do the same. And so this looks crazy. Don't let that make you sad. Um, when I'm looking for hydrogen bonds, recall that hydrogen bonds just want to have fun, right? Hopefully you got that right on the quiz. Yeah, okay. Um, and so when I'm looking for hydrogen bonds, I want to see that there is an F, O, or N here, and an F, O, or N. Or in here, and it's a hydrogen bond, so I guess I need a hydrogen in the middle. Like a bologna sandwich has bologna in the middle, hydrogen bond has hydrogen in the middle, okay? 
And so uh, when I'm looking for hydrogen bonds, I'm looking for a hydrogen in the middle with a real intramolecular bond with a line and with a fake line. And the one with a fake line needs at least one lone pair. That's all it is, okay? Um, and so here is water and methanol. And methanol actually hydrogen bond with itself too, and I think I had drawn that on Friday. Um, but anyway, here's a sandwich, real line, fake line, lone pair, looking good. Yes? It has to have a lone pair on the intermolecular side of it, on the dashed line side of it, right? So, you know, this oxygen doesn't have to have a lone pair, but this one has to have one. See? Yes, sir? So, on both sides of the hydrogen, it has to be one of them. Yeah. So, so it can't be like four of them, one side, and the hydrogen. No. So, hydrogen we're making a sandwich. We have wheat bread, rye bread, or white bread. Did I say that already? White wheat and broccoli. Is that what? Give me some bread. I don't even eat bread. This is, I'm being awkward right now. This is how you know I'm weird. Um, give me some bread. White wheat. Pumpernickel. And so you can have those are your three kinds of breads, and you can have those three kinds over here. But you can't have any other kind of bread. So no other kind of bread. I don't know. Focaccia. No focaccia bread. That's a word, right? Pita bread. No pita bread is allowed. No what? That's how you know your teacher don't eat sandwiches, okay? Move it on. I know more about hydrogen bonds than I do about bread types. Um, okay, so here are some hydrogen bonds, and you can see those. Um, making a little sandwich. Real line, intermolecular, intermolecular attraction, lone pair. Looking good. Um, and so if you're... And this will happen. They'll give you a molecule. It could be huge. It could be really intimidating. I want to freak you out. And if you're trying to decide if it hydrogen bonds or not, then all you got to look for is that Lewis structure line, intramolecular bond, and look for a hydrogen in the NO or F. If it doesn't have one, it can't hydrogen bond. So you don't even need to worry about the lone pair for anything else. There's not a hydrogen in this picture bonded to a nitrogen oxygen chlorine. So it doesn't hydrogen bond. Done. Yeah, it's going to have a, there's a dipole. There's a negative dipole right here because this is a polar bond, but that doesn't mean anything. So this would be an example of a dipole-dipole, but not a hydrogen bond. And y'all remember, a hydrogen bond is a special kind of dipole-dipole. Okay. All right, we had talked about this, um, and we had um, discussed how, you know, boiling point here is 100, and so it goes down as I uh, go to hydrogen sulfide, right? and then it goes back up. And so the reason it goes back down is because hydrogen sulfide gas does not hydrogen bond. It is polar, right? so dipole, dipole, but uh, decrease. And then again, it increases as I go down a group because um, tellurium and selenium are more polarizable because they have a larger number of electrons. And so these are going to have greater London dispersion forces, right? That's the little blocks on the table kind of coming together randomly and making a temporary dipole. How do you feel? Feeling good? Yeah, okay. Um, kind of going back over everything. Dipole and deuce dipole, that doesn't come up too much, but like I think on Friday I had said, you know, if you had chlorine gas and you dissolve it in water, that would be an example of this. Um, and so it would create a pole on the nonpolar molecule as um, this polar molecule induced the dipole in the nonpolar. Yay. Um, London dispersion forces, LDFs, they're in everything. Okay? They're also known as induced dipole, induced dipole. Right? Like a random dipole makes another random dipole. Okay? Um, and they can be, this is really kind of interesting, if I look, we, we already went through this, how the electrons kind of wander around like a flock of sheep, right? And so that creates an instantaneous dipole in different places. Overall, over time, it, it evens out. Um, but notice here the boiling point for iodine, which is nonpolar, is 460 degrees Kelvin. All right? The boiling point in Kelvin for water is 373 degrees, right? So water's polar. Iodine is completely nonpolar. And water hydrogen bonds. Okay, so the London dispersion forces in iodine are greater than the than the hydrogen bonds in water because it is so polarizable. Because in those two iodines, you have 106 electrons. So 
when they're going to test you, what this is this is what would happen on the AP exam. Did you these black and white? Like you can't all you don't know all that, and you don't need to know all that. But what they would say was would say something like water creates hydrogen bonds and has an unusual you know boiling point for its molar mass, and so you would have to maybe talk about hydrogen bonds a little bit. And then in part B, they would say iodine has a boiling point of 460 degrees Kelvin. Explain why that is more than water. And so, you know, it's not polar, so you don't have that latency going on, but you would have to say it is so polarizable because there's already a number of electrons. So the limited dispersion forces in iodine are harder to overcome than the hydrogen bonds in water, even though physically the hydrogen bonds would be smart, stronger. Yeah, you, you've seen that. You saw that on the last test. Here's an element. Here's an element. Here's something random about it. Compare it out real quick. So, the good news is, really, to be honest with you, they test about hydrogen bonding and London dispersion. And they would like to pull in that dipole ion thing. And then they'll be like, they've done it twice now. Like, draw the water around it. Okay, I'll do that for you. So, that's the thing. Um, so that's that's that. Um, and so again, uh, it's really those outer electrons that are getting polarized. So we had talked about that a little bit with the noble gases, like like radon has 86 electrons, right? But bromine, Br2, only has, has 70, right? And so, but bromine is still liquid. Why? More of those are valence electrons, okay? Um, this is a deal we had talked about on Friday with the little um, clay. I had talked to y'all have a clay ball. If I have a spherical molecule or a round molecule, it is going to have less surface area than if I squish it down. Like if I make it flat, right? Like if I make this a more planar, flat plane kind of molecule, I now have more surface area where uh, temporary dipoles can be induced. Right? So this is more polarizable because I have more surface area where the um, the molecule of uh, the molecule, right? I have more of the atoms in this little flat plane like on this play-doh and those can become polarized. I have a larger surface over which the atoms and the molecule can become polarized. When I say polarized, I just mean that the electrons will temporarily go to one side of it. Happy times? Alright, so this one is uh, more polarizable. So the, what they'll do, they'll throw up a big, um, these are isomers of each other. They have the same formula. C I don't, I'm, I don't know the number, but like let's say this is C10H, you know, 24, I don't know. And this one is two, these are isomers. So they'll say, oh, these are two isomers of the uh, compound, and they're the same of them. Which one has a higher boiling point and why? And they'll just throw two random pictures, and that's really scary. But the thing is, you would say molecule B or two because um, of its increased surface area because it's linear shape or it's planar shape, and I say plan means flat, right? So it has a larger surface area where the uh, atoms can become polarized in the molecule, creating uh, more opportunities for temporary dipoles, and so it will experience more London dispersion forces, which will increase the bullet point. How you feeling? Hang with me. It's the same magic words over and over again, okay? So that's the positive part of it, I suppose. Anyway, so here is a kind of continuum of intermolecular forces. There are some exceptions. I'm going to talk about it. So ion, ion, that's the ionic bond. I don't even like that they put that with molecular. Like, let me just quit my job right now. But um, ion, ion forces can be weaker than ion dipole. If they are weaker than ion dipole, then it won't dissolve. Excuse me, it'll dissolve, right? And so this can go back and forth depending on your Coulomb contraction of your ions. Can you imagine, like, Three months ago, I was having this conversation. And but then sulfate is a is a big ion too, and so and then oxygen's really electronegative. There's a lot going on there. Yeah, that's I think that's part of the issue too. Um, and that has to go like why sulfuric acid is strong acid versus um, that's what it's that's the thing. Um, anyway. I forgot what's talking about. Oh, okay. So hydrogen bonds, remember, are a special type of dipole dipole. And so hydrogen bonds will be stronger than a dipole dipole. They're a special type of dipole dipole. Then we have ion induced dipole. That doesn't happen a whole lot. 
Um, so the dipole and eustopole is something where I have the chlorine gas in the water, right? And then lemma dispersion is in everything mm -hmm. and in everything, okay? And so <clears throat> we had talked about plastic, right? This is a plastic cup. Plastic is made of oil. Oil is nonpolar, right? That's why you can't get it to dissolve in water. <sighs> Salad dressing for the win. Um, but this plastic is held together by nothing but London dispersion forces, which those are really long molecules, polymers that repeat hundreds of times. And so that's why it's a solid at room temperature. But that's also why if I put this for a second on accident on a hot plate, it's going to melt. I'm going to keep holding it together with London dispersion forces. That's how tape and stuff works too. Intermolecular forces, they have these really long, sticky, planar molecules. And so it sticks to you. It's just tape ain't nothing but London dispersion forces. Does it change you chemically? No. No, it doesn't. I think this is what material science and chemical engineering goes into a lot, like how to design these things using intermolecular forces. So I find this to be very interesting. If you're doing like a chemistry Olympiad, like the material science event is this. So <clears throat> anyway, um, which one has a higher boiling point? So let's go ahead and look at this. Um, both of these are nonpolar, but if you think about this, the carbon carbon, this one has three carbons. Um, this um, propane has three carbons. And so it's going to, you don't want to say, you don't ever want to refer to the size of the molecule. You got to be really careful. Okay. Refer to the shape and the number of electrons. Okay. But the uh, propane has uh, a larger number of electrons, so it is more polarizable than um, the ethane there. And so uh, the boiling point is going to be greater because it is more polarizable and will experience more London dispersion forces. How do you feel? Do you want to practice now? Let's do it. Okay, so what we're going to be, avert your eyes for a second. Close your eyes. I'm serious. Okay. I was trying to remember what they had here. Okay, um, so what you're going to do for me is you're going to um, help me find my pen. And then, did I have it? So I see it. Andrew, you are my best friend. Um, so what you're going to do here is you're going to um, kind of, you don't have to draw the molecule, but right here you're going to put um, polar or not polar. And then right here you're going to tell me the type of IMFs, intermolecular forces. So that could be ion dipole, London dispersion forces, uh, hydrogen bond, whatever. Okay? And then down here you're going to tell me if it has a high boiling point or a low boiling point. So just basically draw me out a little chart and answer those for these. And so high and low is going to be relative to the other one. So a high boiling point could be negative 100, but relatively speaking, which one has a higher boiling point? So this is the stuff of your test. This is the stuff of the AP exam. They like this. Just like that last test, but now we're asking about this stuff. So polar or nonpolar, IMFs, high bone point, low bone point.
That, that that's an alcohol, right? Um, as I'm looking at this, <coughs> you have to understand that carbon hydrogen bonds are nonpolar, and then carbon oxygen bonds are polar. So I see one polar bond that is not matched in sym symmetry anywhere, right? So that was gold. Um, I want you to start looking for that though. That's a really common thing to have to look for. If you have a carbon oxygen bond, unless it's something like carbon dioxide where you, it's the same on both sides, it's going to be polar right there, okay? Uh, or overall, I should say. Um, so, Courtney, I did the first one. This one's polar. What did you get for that? Okay, cool. And so, what types of intermolecular forces are uh, uh, present um, on the ethanol? Yeah. And then here we just have dispersion forces. And so, based off of your answer there, which one has uh, a higher boiling point, do you think? Yeah, because it can hydrogen bond. Yes, sir. Got it? Okay. All right, so go ahead and give this one, polar, nonpolar, types of intermolecular forces. And then um, I don't know what they had for this extra one, but if you do those three, I'd be happy, okay? It's either when you start adding more hydroxyl groups, it you get ketones and then sugars and stuff like acetone. But I don't really know. Um, it would be something like right. So it would be like two um, propyl something. I mean, you could name it the formal name, but as far as its informal name. Um, I don't really know. Sorry. Unqualified to answer your question. But I think it is. Mm. Might be an aldehyde too. No, ketones have double bonds. Maybe it's an aldehyde. Mm -hmm. No, they have a double bond too. Hmm. No one ever says the name of it. Yeah, those would have those carbonyl groups, which is a carbon double oxygen. I know that. Um, Y'all got it? Oh, everybody's packing up. Oh, it's time to go. Okay, well, that's fair. Um, let's go through these real quick. Polar, they're both polar. This one, hydrogen bonds and has London dispersion. This actually hydrogen bonds in two places and has London dispersion forces, but the London dispersion forces are greater because it is more polarizable because it is a larger number of electrons. And so the boiling point for this one is much greater. And I wish I knew what that was. I'll I'm going to figure it out. 